File 100, Chapter 41, Osmotic Regulation and Excretion. We're actually going to be talking about the urinary system, which is also commonly called the excretory system. All right, so when we're talking about this system, one of the first things we really want to talk about is osmoregulation. Your book goes into this, and it even talks about different aquatic and terrestrial animals. We are just going to focus on humans in this, but if you are interested in how other animals can osmoregulate, please feel free to read in the book or look it up. Um, you can also ask questions. But what is osmoregulation? Osmoregulation is just the process of maintaining salt and water balance, which is also known as osmotic balance, across membranes within your body's fluids. So basically, it's keeping your salt and your water balance, right? We want to make sure that we're hydrated. We don't have too many salts um, in one area. Both your electrolytes and non-electrolytes are contributing to this um, osmotic balance. And some important ions that we're making sure that are kept in check are both cations and anions. So cations meaning our positive ions and then anions meaning our negative ones. So our positives, we have sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Negative, we've got chloride, carbonate, bicarbonate, and phosphate. And the reason why we talk about osmoregulation within the urinary system or the excretory system is because this is pretty much the main job of, of the system. And it's important, right? Um, you can see that this, if you have ever dealt with pH um, readings of any sense, like if you've had an aquarium or something like that, um, some of these chemicals might sound, or not chemicals, but some of these ions might sound familiar to you, like bicarbonate, carbonate. Um, uh, I'm sure some of these other ones sound familiar too, but this is also really important in maintaining a healthy pH within the body. So osmoregulation throughout the body and within the system is really helping maintain our homeostasis. It's one of the largest contributors to our level of homeostasis. So kind of keeping everything within normal levels that keep our body running optimally. Okay, so we have gone over this before in class, but just a little refresher. We have hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic solutions. And so this matters depending on how your body is doing, right? And we'll talk about here in a second when we feel thirsty or how we're taking up water and how our body's dealing with that, how it's moving water to and from, how we're osmoregulating. Um, but just kind of keep this in mind. So hypertonic solution if a cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, then it's going to essentially shrivel, shrivel up, um, become crenated, and all the water is going to leave the cell, right? So again, these solutions are just about finding a healthy balance. So isotonic solution, it means that the net movement is zero, right? We have the same amount of water coming into the cell as we do coming out of the cell. Hypotonic solution means that we've got more water coming into the cell. So they're actually going to blow up nice and big and could potentially lice or actually blow up essentially. So a hypertonic solution is like a really salty solution, right? So we're um, going to take all the water out of our cells to push it out into that salty solution to try to make it more like what our cells look like. Hypotonic is the opposite where now we have really salty cells compared to the outside environment. So now we're going to move the water into the cells to try to make it balance out to what the outside environment looks like. So all of this is happening throughout our body and in the excretory system. That's where we're regulating our body fluid concentrations. It does depend on the um, concentration of mineral ions like sodium and potassium. And we get our water right through either drinking, food, or our metabolism as well. And remember, water tends to move into the region with the lowest water concentration. So we're always going from a high to a low. Okay. Important to remember because that's the easiest way for really anything in our body to move by just simple diffusion we're moving from a high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient so if we're in a hypertonic environment that's the way that the um 
that the water net water movement is going to go is also from the high to the low. Getting into our urinary system in humans, um, this is going to be a very brief overview of what this looks like. It does get obviously much more complicated. There are entire careers and researchers dedicated to just looking at kidney function. Um, so take this at its very basic level. But the main stars of the show, the urinary system or the excretory system in humans is the kidneys. Okay, so the kidneys are located kind of in the back of the body next to the um, one on each side of the vertebral column and just below the diaphragm. Each kidney here, you can see the adrenal gland is kind of on top or just um, dorsal to the kidney. And then following from the kidneys, we have these two um, kind of like tube looking things. Those are ureters. So that is going to bring the urine down into the bladder where it will then sit until it tells us, okay, your bladder's really full, need to get rid of this urine and it's going to go out the urethra and to wherever you put it, right? Um, so each kidney is connected to the ureter and that's what's conducting urine again from the kidney to the urinary bladder and then going through the urethra. Each kidney is composed of many tubular nephrons. So a nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Okay, and each kidney has thousands of these, probably over a million of these tubular nephrons. So it's a really complex system. And it's interesting because it's really complex. This is the excretory system. We're excreting things. But really, the main thing that we're, we're doing in the system is actually reabsorbing. We are getting rid of things. We're getting rid of metabolic waste that we don't need. Um, and a few other things, but we're also reabsorbing a lot of it as well. But within each kidney, each one of these nephrons contains several different parts. So we have what's called a glomerular capsule, a glomerulus, a proximal convoluted tubule, convoluted tubule, proximal meaning close to, so, and convoluted meaning like twisty. So basically this is the closest twisty tube to this beginning part of the nephron. Then we have the loop of the nephron, or also known as the loop of Henle, more commonly known as that. And then the distal convoluted tubule, um, again, distal means more distant. So this is more distant from the beginning um, and into collecting ducts. Okay, so going into the kidneys, um, the kidneys main goal here is really to filter our blood. So our blood is entering the kidneys. It's coming in um, through the renal artery. So all the unfiltered blood basically is coming in through this renal artery. And then it's going into this first part here, which is the glomerular capsule, or sorry, really, I should say it's going into first the glomerulus. So it's kind of like a network of capillaries, which are like those thin walled um, blood vessels that are responsible for more gas exchange and things like that. So we're going into the glomerulus. This is what's considered the renal cortex. So a few, a few things to kind of unpack here. One, whenever you see the word renal, renal has to do with your kidneys. So if you see the word renal, we know it has to do with our urinary system or excretory system, and more specifically, we're talking about kidneys. The other thing is, your book doesn't talk too much about this, but you can kind of see it here. Um, this top part here is the renal cortex, and then the bottom part here is the renal medulla. Anytime we're talking about cortex, cortex is like an outer layer. So um, cortex usually refers to like bark of a tree, type of thing. So you can think of the cortex being the outer layer. Medulla, similar to middle. Medulla is getting more into the middle or into the thick of something. So within our renal cortex here, we're entering, our unfiltered blood is entering into the glomerulus. It's then going into this thing called the Bowman's capsule, also known as the glomerular capsule, um, whatever way you want to talk about it. I usually say Bowman's capsule, so keep that in mind. And now our blood is becoming something known as filtrate. So it's not 
it's now being filtered and we're kind of concentrating what we need, what we don't need um, from it. And from the Bowman's capsule, now we are going into this proximal convoluted tubule and we're sending our filtrate into here. So this is actually where osmoregulation is going to occur and we're going to reabsorb some of what we need. Um, most of what's being reabsorbed here in the proximal convoluted tubule is things like glucose, amino acids, um, maybe some sodium chloride, water, those things are being absorbed here. And then the um, filtrate is continuing down into the medulla, going into this thing called the loop of Henle. Okay. Or you might see it just called loop of the nephron. But loop of Henle, there is a descending limb and an ascending limb. And basically what this is doing, it's doing a few things. So it's extracting more of the water that we need. It's also pumping out salt. And it's also making the medulla, this inner layer um, or middle layer of the kidney, it's making it hypertonic. So it's making it essentially super salty which allows it to draw out even more water from the filtrate that's passing through this whole system. So it's an interesting, um, this is basically what allows us to get even more and more water, okay, um, into our body so that we can get rid of all the excess stuff that we don't necessarily need. So from this loop of Henle, now we're going up into this distal convoluted tubule, and again, more regulating ions in here. And then it'll go into these collecting ducts. Collecting ducts are essentially, I guess, where we're really, again, more regulation is occurring. Um, and that's all regulated mostly by hormones. Okay, so there's lots of different hormones that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but hormones are regulating this part of it. And then from there, we're going to go into the ureter, which will then send, um, and at that point, we're actually talking about urine. We're no longer talking about this filtrate that has been going through this whole system within the kidney. So once it's turned into, from gone from filtrate into urine, then it's going to go into the ureter and then into the bladder and following the urethra. Again, in the kidneys, we have the renal cortex, which is kind of the outer layer. Um, and it does have kind of a granular looking appearance. And then in the middle, we have the renal medulla, which is cone shaped, um, full of cone shaped renal pyramids. And then we also have the renal pelvis, which is hollow chambered innermost part of the kidney. So this is the very middle um, and really at the level we're digging into. We're more concerned with the cortex and medulla. Just kind of another look at the kidney here. Um, you can see the renal artery, which is bringing our unfiltered blood in, and it's going to essentially go into all of these capillaries, go into um, the renal cortex area where it'll go through the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. And then it'll go through these renal pyramids. Um, you see the renal pelvis here. The medulla is kind of all this middle area here as well. And then once it's nice and filtered, then it's going to go out this ureter and onto the bladder and so on and so forth. So for us to process that filtrate into urine, there's three different processes that have to happen. One, we have glomerular filtration, which is in essentially in Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. We also have tubular reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule. So again, this is where we're reabsorbing a lot of the different things that we need, like glucose, amino acids, salts, water. And then we also have tubular secretion at the distal convoluted tubule. Um, so this is when we're getting rid of even more stuff. Um, exchanging out some of those regulating ions that we may or may not need so that we can eventually form urine from the filtrate that came from the unfiltered blood entering into the kidneys. Okay, so excretion of hypertonic urine. So again, this is very salty urine essentially, and this depends on the reabsorption of water, right? 
and we're reabsorbing that water mostly in the loop of the um, nephron, which is the loop of Henle, and also in the collecting duct. But remember that osmotic gradient within the renal medulla is what's causing the water to leave the descending limb along its entire length. So in the loop of Henle, when we make it super salty, we make it hypertonic, that means that we are essentially going to be reabsorbing more and more water. Okay. One of the main hormones that plays a big role in this is antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. I think it's referred to as in your book as well. Um, this is what plays a big role in water reabsorption, and it's released by the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, which is in your brain. Um, this is an interesting hormone. If any of you, um, sorry, if some of you are underage, but if any of you have ever drank a lot or had a few too many drinks, um, and this might be getting <laughs> into something I shouldn't be talking about, but say you've had one too many drinks, um, and you might notice it like, Hey, I have to pee a lot. And that's because alcohol actually interferes with a lot of the hormones that regulate this process. One of them being this ADH, this antidiuretic hormone. So normally what this hormone does is it tells your collecting ducts that they need to be really porous so that they can reabsorb more water. And when alcohol is involved or if something's wrong with your hormone levels in general, um, what's happening is you're not reabsorbing all that water, so you're actually getting really dehydrated, which is one of the reasons why you're dehydrated, but also why you're going to wake up hungover the next morning. So just a little bit on antidiuretic hormone. Okay, um, back to the urinary system or the excretory system and it being really important in homeostasis. So we're maintaining blood pH. We're also maintaining osmolarity, volume, and pressure. So more than 99% of sodium, which is our Na plus ion, is filtered at the glomerulus it, um, and then it's returned to the blood at the distal convoluted tubule. Reabsorption of sodium and or water is regulated by hormones. This is regulated by a few different hormones, including the um, antidiuretic hormone that we just talked about. Also aldosterone, renin, which is made by adrenal glands. Remember, these are just on top of the kidneys. Um, made by adrenal glands when your blood pressure is low. Also, and uh, atrial natriuretic peptide hormone, AMP, which is actually made by your heart when your blood volume is high. And then the pH of your blood actually gets adjusted by either reabsorbing bicarbonate ions. So if we need to make it slightly more um, basic or secretion of hydrogen ions, making it slightly more acidic, just so that we can keep it within the range that we want it for optimal body functioning. Um, remember, homeostasis operates within a really narrow range, essentially. We, if our pH rises or lowers too much, you know, even a point, that's huge within our body. Um, our blood pH is normally like a 7.4. So if it's moving far from that, we're going to have a lot of problems. So these hormones and these processes are responsible for maintaining that. I'm talking about a few different things that can happen within the urinary system. Um, if you do have issues with anything, hemodialysis is a big one. Um, so if you are in need of a new kidney or if that's not plausible and your kidneys aren't really functioning correctly, then you go through hemodialysis, which is basically a clinical purification of your blood by dialysis. And it's substituting for the normal function of the kidney. You have the blood that's being removed for cleaning, going through the dialyser, um, and essentially removing out any of the waste products from there, and then returning cleaned blood back to your body. Okay, with nitrogenous waste products, um, you'll see this talked about in the book, and it gets into it a little bit further, talking about it with other, especially aquatic animals. But catabolism of amino acids, which means basically breaking down amino acids and nucleic acids, is going to result in forming something called ammonia. Ammonia is really, really toxic to almost all animals, including humans. And so what happens is we convert that ammonia into something else. Um, 
this happens differently in different groups of animals but for us we actually convert it into urea and that causes loss of much water per unit of nitrogen so that means that we have to drink a lot of water essentially okay again more hormonal control so different hormones that control um parts of osmoregulation within the urinary system we have epinephrine and norepinephrine these are produced in the adrenal medulla um, and they can decrease kidney function temporarily by vasoconstriction meaning um, constricting your blood vessels renin this is made within the kidney this is increasing your blood pressure angiotensin aldosterone again the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin and uh, atrial nitriuretic peptide produced in the heart all of these are responsible for osmoregulation at one point or another some more than others um, antidiuretic hormone is one that we definitely hear about quite a bit you can go through this a little bit more in your book I'm not going to talk about it too extensively um, because this is kind of more of a at the level that we're talking about it, it's more of a memorization um, and looking to see what hormones are made in what areas of the body and what they're really used for. Um, we won't go into too much of the hormonal control hormones. You could spend literally a whole semester talking about and you're still only going to scratch the very surface of it. But, um, you know, different things are being triggered by the release of different hormones and some of them are coming from the brain, some of them from the liver, your heart, the kidney, all of these are working together to maintain that homeostasis within your body, make sure your blood pH is normal, make sure we're osmoregulating so that we have the electrolytes, the ions that we need within our body to function well, but that we're also getting rid of any of the excess, right? So you see this too, like if you take too many vitamins, right? What happens to your pee? You notice you notice that your pee changes color or changes smell with different things that you're intaking in your body, not just vitamins, but any, you know, certain vegetables, you might notice different things with your pee. Um, or if you're dehydrated, right? If you're dehydrated, what color is your pee? It's usually like a really dark um, yellow. And if you're really hydrated, you're actually going to see very clear, very light yellow pee. Um, and just think about that as you're, you know, going through life and these things are happening. Think about what your kidneys are doing. Maybe they're working a little overtime trying to filter in whatever you're taking in through your body. Um, or, you know, these things tell you about whether you need to drink more too. Do you need to intake more water because your body's getting dehydrated? Did you just drink a lot last night and now you're hungover? Um, and you can see that your pee is a little bit darker because you've screwed up that antidiuretic hormone, whatever it is. Um, try to think about these things a little bit more um, as you're living your life. And hopefully that's something that makes a little bit more sense and is a little bit more helpful. Again, we're just scratching the very surface of it, but it is a really cool system to get to know. And if you are wanting to learn more, you can definitely read about it a little bit more in the text watch some of the fun animation videos and or you can always ask me about it as well.